Section 13.3 is the fundamental theorem for line integrals. So we'll see a generalization of the fundamental theorem of calculus to, um, to line integrals in this section. So first, let's just remind ourselves what that fundamental theorem of calculus looks like. And that's if we're taking the integral from a to b of some function which has an antiderivative, in this case, f prime has antiderivative f, uh, then we know that the anti the integral from a to b of this function is equal to the antiderivative at b minus the antiderivative at a. And this is a really impressive result. We take it for granted all the time in calculus, but it really tells us that everything that happens in this definite integral is just based on the evaluation of an antiderivative at the point b and the evaluation of that antiderivative at the point a. So it's kind of a, a very interesting and powerful result that we use all throughout calculus and been taking for, for granted for a while now. So let's see um, a similar result for line integrals. So we let C be a smooth curve given by the vector function r of t, and t ranges from a to b. So our parameterization r for parameter t. And we're going to let f be a differentiable function of two or three variables whose gradient vector is continuous on this curve c. Then the line integral of this gradient of f is equal to f of r of b minus f of r of a. Now again, look at the similarity between the, the fundamental theorem of calculus and this line integral result. So we're taking the line integral of this of gradient of f along this curve c. And in some sense, the gradient of f can be thought of as the derivative of this function f. And what this whole line integral Come, comes down to in terms of evaluating is just the value of f at the endpoint of the curve c minus the, evaluate, uh, the evaluation of f at the initial point of c. So very similar to the fundamental theorem of calculus for a single variable. So let's have a quick look at uh, the proof of this result. So if we let c be the closed cur smooth curve as given above, r is the parameterization of c from a to b, T ranges from A to B, and F is a differentiable function of three variables with a continuous gradient vector, uh, gradient of F. So then our left side of the equation, the line integral over gradient of F, by definition, is equal to the following. R go, T goes from A to B for our function R of T. And we notice that gradient of F at r dotted with r prime of t. Well, this is partial of f with respect to x, partial of f with respect to y, and with respect to z as a vector, dotted with the vector r prime of t, which is the ordinary derivative, vector derivative of r, that's dx dt, dy dt, dz dt as a vector. When we dot these two vectors, we get these products, first components times each other, second components, and third components times each other all added up, dt at the end. And when we take a look at this expression in the integrand, we realize that that's just the expanded chain rule of the, deriv the total derivative with respect to t, d dt of f of r of t. So if we were to work backwards from here to the line above, then we would see that this is in fact the case. Now we pack this in as d dt of f of r of t. We're taking the integral with respect to t from a to b. And what we realize is that this is a function of a single variable t. So it really is a candidate for the regular fundamental theorem of calculus the, for a single variable. And by that theorem, it's equal to f of r at b, f of r at a, or minus f of r at a. So we've got exactly this, um, where f of r is a function of a single variable to a single variable. So we end up with the result as intended. So it's a very simple theorem. It relies on the fundamental theorem of calculus for a single variable, but we get uh, now this nice result that we can use to simplify calculations in the future. So let's have a look real quick at one of its applications. So we're asked to find the work done by the gravitational field given here. We've looked at this before. We actually realized that this gravitational field is, is a conservative field. 
conservative vector field, which means that it has some function lowercase f, such that the gradient of f was equal to the vector field. And we recall from a previous result that this is this function right here. So the gradient of f will give us um, this vector function f were we to take it. We've already proved that that's the case in a previous section, so we'll leave it as is. Now to calculate the work done for moving one point from a particle from this point to this second point, well, the work is the line integral of the vector field f dotted with dr. And well, we've, got, we've done the work of determining the line segment that connects these two points, but it'll turn out we actually don't need it. Um, we've just done it to demonstrate that we could and just sort of point out the work that we're actually skipping in this situation. In section 13.2, when we dealt with line integrals, we had to parameterize R of T, we had to expand all of this and write out these functions of T and integrate with respect to T. Thanks to the fundamental theorem for line integrals, we don't have to do that. But um, you know, off on the side, we've just pointed out the work that we're actually skipping. We just note that R of zero is this point, and r of 1 is this point. And we can plug each of those in and see that that's the case. Um, in the future, we can just believe that we can come up with a line segment between two points or any smooth curve between two points, and that would be sufficient. So anyway, our work integral becomes, uh, we swap out gradient of f for the vector field, r of t, at least we think of it in this light. Um, the definition of that line integral is as follows, dotted with r prime of t going from 0 to 1 for t. And by the fundamental theorem for line integrals, we have the evaluation of f of r of t at the endpoint t equals 1 and f of r of t at t equals 0. And that's essentially r of 1 and r of 0 is 0, 5, negative 2, the terminal point, and the initial point, negative 1, 1, 3 at t equals 0. And evaluating that, we come out to a reasonably simplified answer of this. So that's the work done by this gravitational field and moving from uh, the first point to the second point given the problem. So let's think about uh, an important concept uh, called independence of path now. And one implication of the fundamental theorem for line integrals is the following. If we have two paths, C1, that connect A to B and C2, that also connects A to B, then we realize that the endpoints of each of these curves are the same. And if the line integral for a function gradient of f, where the gradient of f is continuous, and c1 and c2 are smooth curves, well then each of these is just equal to f at this endpoint minus f at that endpoint. Since they're both equal at these endpoints, then their line integrals are also equal. So this is for any two paths, C1 and C2, uh, paths being piecewise smooth curves. Now, taking that a bit further, we'll talk about a general vector field, F, just continuous with domain D. We'll say that it is independent of path if the line integral of F over C1 equals the line integral of F over C2 for any two paths c1 and c2 in a given domain okay that have the same initial points and same terminal points so path independence of a vector field of a of the line integral of a vector field now uh, this is a more general situation because this vector field f is not necessarily a conservative vector field at least not yet we're just talking about uh, these vector fields as having independence of path if they happen to satisfy this result we're gonna make some connections in the next page though. So first we need to define one more thing, a closed curve. A curve is closed if its terminal point and initial point coincide, i.e. are equal to each other. So the picture of a closed curve is exactly what we might imagine. Start at R of A, travel around C in some direction and we end up at R of B. And it turns out that R of A is equal to R of B. So Yes, our initial point and our terminal point are equal in a closed curve. In other words, there are no loose ends on a closed curve. So let's have a look at independence of path and closed curves. So the line integral over C 
of the vector field F is independent of path in D if and only if the line integral of F over C is equal to zero for every closed path C in D. Okay, so we'll say it like this. The line integral is independent of path if and only if the line, or the, the line integral equals zero for every closed C. To summarize that. Okay, and this is for a general vector field um, F, not necessarily the gradient of F. That one's already been established. So this is an if and only if statement. The proof will require two parts. Uh, the first statement implying the second is the only if component. So we'll assume for the only if component that this integral is independent of path. And let's think about a path. We'll have C overall will be this path, this closed curve. C right here, and it's been split into two parts, C1 and C2. We picked out arbitrary points A and B, maybe R of A is equal to R of B along this path. It's not necessarily, uh, didn't necessarily need to be written down, but just to have an idea of what's going on with it. I've got it here. Now, if we travel from C1 to B, or so, so we travel along C1, we pass from A to B. If we travel from Along C2, we pass also from A to B. Now, since the integral, the line integral of F over C is independent of path, that's our assumption for the only if portion of the proof, then the line integral along C is equal to the line integral of C1 plus the line integral of uh, along the negative direction of C2. So in other words, what this is telling us is in moving from A to B along C1, we're going in the positive direction for C. But in going from B to A to finish out the curve C, we have to travel in the opposite direction of C2 to wind up back at A. So that's what the negative C2 indicates. We're running C, the curve C2 in reverse from how it's actually been built. And with that in mind, though, we can have a look at what that does to the integral overall. And Running this one in reverse is the same as running it forward, but with a negative result. So we're able to rewrite the integral of f over the closed curve c as the difference of these two paths here. But what we need to recall is that the integral of the line integral of f over c1 and the line integral of f over c2, since c1 and c2 have the same endpoints, they're equal to each other. If we're taking their difference, then two things, the difference of two things that are equal is zero. Okay, and that happens, the reason that they're equal is because the line integral of f is independent of path. All right, so, or path independent. All right, so that proves uh, the first direction. So that if we have a path independent line integral f over c, then the, the line integral over any closed curve C is equal to zero. From the top left to bottom right in this, in this line here. Now let's assume the opposite. Let's assume that um, the line integral of every closed path C is equal to zero and see how that implies that we have an independence of path. So we start by writing down that uh, zero is equal to uh, the line integral of F over this closed curve C. And then we again split it similar to how we did before. Um, the line integral of f over c is equal to um, traveling c1 in the positive direction, c2 in the negative direction gives us exactly our path c that we've got here. And again, we can have a look at this portion here. Running this line integral in reverse along c2 is the same as subtracting that line integral in the positive direction along C2. So what we've got now is that this difference is equal to zero. So these two line integrals are actually equal to each other, which tells us that, well, this can be done for any two curves, C1 and C2, that have uh, the same endpoints because they'll form ultimately a closed curve like we have in C. So this is true for any, um, any two, any two uh, paths C1 and C2 in the domain D.
So now we have path independence um, if the line integral for every closed curve is actually equal to zero. So this is a characterization of a path independent line integral that um, it's the integral of it over any closed path is zero. So we'll use that to go back and forth uh, between classifying these uh, vector fields and line integrals. Now we need a couple definitions for the next result. A set D is open if for every point P in D there exists a disk with center P which is completely contained in D. So off to the right we've got a decent example of that. Uh, usually an open set is drawn with dashed borders or dotted borders or dotted boundaries so we realize that it doesn't include the points on its boundary. And what that leaves a possibility for is we can get arbitrarily close to that boundary, say at this point, the red dot in the center of that, and we can still form an open disk around that point. Now, if I could draw more finely with my uh, tablet tools or whatever, I could, I could get even closer to that boundary, but we can imagine that happening. So an open set has exactly that characteristic. We can form an open disk around any point in an open set, which is completely contained inside that set still. We couldn't do that with a closed set because if we had a point on the boundary, no matter what we do, a circle around a point on the boundary would be outside that set D at some point. So that's to contrast to a closed set or at least a non-open set. So uh, the next definition is that D is connected if, if any two points in D can be joined by a line set or path which lies entirely in D. So off to the left, we've got an example of that. So this is a connected set D. So we notice for any two points A and B, we can form some path, a smooth curve from A to B or a piecewise smooth curve from A to B. Now that's opposed to a set D, which is not connected. It's comp comprised of these two sort of uh, disjoint regions. And we see that a point A and a point B in either one of these, there's no line segment that travels from A to B that are no curve or path that travels from A to B that doesn't leave the set D. So that's the difference between a connected set and, and uh, a set that's not connected. So with those definitions in mind, we can now talk about what a, uh, the next result we've got. We've got suppose that F is a vector field that's continuous on an open connected region D. So that would be, here's a connected region. Its boundary would be dotted or dashed. It, uh, we can form a, an open set around any point in that region D. And if the line integral of F over C is independent of path and D, then F is a conservative vector field on D i.e. there exists a function f, little f, such that the gradient of f is equal to capital F. That's just the definition of a conservative vector field. So let's see how and why that's the case. Ultimately, the result of this proof is going to be to build a function, lowercase f, whose gradient is equal to the vector field f. Okay, so in doing so, let's write some things down about f. We assume everything, and this is just a sketch of the proof, a more full version of it occurs in the textbook. But let's assume that the vector field F has two components, P and Q, both are functions of X and Y. And we're going to define little f, F of X, Y, is equal to the line integral of F along some path C, okay? And C is going to travel from the point A, B to a point X, Y. So let's mark that out off to the side. This is arbitrarily decided, A, B, travels to the point, or AB travels to the point XY along the curve C, the smooth curve of the path C. Now we can split that up since F is path independent in D as two curves, one is C1 and another one is C2. And what we've done here is we've, we've, we've made C1 be a curve that gets within an open set of the point X, Y, and has the same, is at a level where the Y values are equal. So we have X1, Y is this point within this set. Now the reason we needed an open set to do this is to know that there is enough space side to side around this point in order to build this little horizontal line here. And that would be the case for any open set. As small as we might shrink that, there's still enough room for a tiny little horizontal line here. And that's all we needed the open set for. 
in this situation. We'll see what that does for us in just a moment. But we note that we go from A to B to X1, Y, some fixed X1, uh, with a y, and then to Y uh, along the, the Y axis. And we travel without changing in Y to the point X, Y along for the curve C2. So since the integral of, of F along C is uh, path independent, uh, we have that, or, or we have that this is path independent for any uh, path C. We have, this is the case that the integral over C is equal to the sum of the integral over C1 plus the, the integral over C2. So we still arrive at the, the, the same endpoints. Now that being the case, let's have a closer look at things. Let's take the partial derivative of this uh, function little f, partial derivative with respect to x. So that's the partial derivative of the path along c1, which would be from the point a, b to x1, y. It's not denoted here in this integral, but that's along the curve c1. This one's along the curve c2. That's further information that, that could be denoted better, but we're just, we wanna see what's happening with the endpoints first. When we look at these two integrals though, we realize that this one really, there's no explicit function of the variable x. We're going from a, b to x1. x1 is some fixed point uh, to the left of x, y in the plane. So the partial derivative of this function altogether is a constant function with respect to x. So its partial derivative with respect to x is zero. And that's what we see off to the left. Now, we add to that the partial derivative of the integral from x1, y to x, y, and that's along the curve c2. Again, that's not written in there, but it's somewhat implicitly understood. It could be denoted a little bit better, but we really want to see these endpoints for now. Now we remember that f decomposes into functions p of x, y, and q of x, y for its x component and y component, or first component and second component. So we'll do that in the next line and summarize that partial derivative with respect to x of little f is equal to the partial derivative with respect to x of this integral from x1 y to x y of our vector field p dx plus q dy. And what we recall now is that along this integral dy from x1 y to x y dy does not change or sorry y does not change Right? There's no change in y. We're at the same level as y for each of these points. So we're moving horizontally. y does not change, so dy is equal to zero. The infinitesimal change in y is zero. So this highlighted term down here is zero. And now we have this partial derivative of the integral from x1 to y to xy of p dx. And we look a little more closely and realize, okay, y is fixed in this. And we'll let t run the parameterization from x1 to x to rewrite our integral as follows. x1 to x, t is going from x1 to x, dt, y is fixed. So we place that into, into the argument of p. And what we see here is that we, we really have a function of one variable. We could rewrite this as some g of t if we needed to do that for um, uh, appearances. And the fundamental theorem of calculus tells us that well, this integral, this is the part one fundamental theorem of calculus, tells us that's, that's just equal to P of X, Y. So we get that the gradient of little f is equal to P of X, Y, and that is exactly the first component of f, if we run an argument that's very similar, but for a vertical line, a little tiny vertical line underneath x, y, we'll find that partial of f with respect to y is equal to q of x, y, and we ha we'll have both components, and we'll see that the gradient of f is equal to capital F, the vector field. So what we've got then is the proof that if a vector field is continuous on an open connected region D, and if it's path independent on that region D, then it's conservative. In other words, we can find a, a, a function f whose gradient is equal to that vector field. Okay, a couple more uh, heady results 
to finish or at least one more heady result to finish and then the next video will have uh, a lot of examples of what we're doing with these things. So uh, this theorem states that if f of x, y equals p of x, y plus q of x, y as vector components is a conservative vector field where p and q have continuous first partial derivatives on d, then everywhere on d we have the following fact. Okay, so what this tells us is that if we have a conservative vector field, it's first partials of its two components, and these are cross partials. P of x, y is the first component, but it's taken, uh, it's partial derivatives taken with respect to a second component, second variable y. And similarly, q is crossed as well. Why is this true? Well, if q and p have continuous first partials, um, if we recall that f is a conservative vector field. Well, f being a conservative vector field means that there exists a little, a scalar function f whose gradient is equal to f, capital F. So this line right here comes about because f is conservative. All right, since the gradient vector field f is equal to pq as a vector, components p and q, and p and q have continuous first partials, we see that taking the partial of f with respect to y is, and we should have one more line in here, and that is that this is the second partial. Okay, so first, the partial of f with respect to x was p in the first place. So p is equal to partial of f with respect to x and q is equal to the partial of little f with respect to y. That's how uh, gradient of f is equal to capital F. The components are equal in that sense. So taking a second derivative for p, but doing it with respect to the partial with respect to y, we get exactly the statement we see here. Uh, with respect to y, the second partial is of a partial f with respect to x is equal to partial p with respect to y. Similarly, since q is equal to the first partial of f with respect to y, take the partial of both sides of this equation with respect to x and we get this equation. Now we realize that we have the mixed second partials of f here and here. They're out of order from each other, but since these two partials are continuous, so are the second partials that they're equal to for f. So this tells us that these two partials are equal to each other by Clairaut's theorem, and that's thanks to the fact that they're continuous. So we have that partial of q with respect to x equals the partial of q with respect to y, or p with respect to y, and we have exactly what we intended to prove. And this all comes from the fact that uh, capital F was a conservative vector field. Now, as a characterization, in other words, this holding in the opposite direction, saying that if this is true, then F is a conservative vector field, um, that, that's a result that will hold, but we need a more uh, robust region. We need a, a more special region for that to be true on. Um, this works for more general regions going this direction, this being a conservative vector field implying this, but the logical converse of that, we need a slightly more uh, a special region. And that's what we see below. We're going to introduce some more notation here. So first, a simple curve is a curve that does not intersect itself between its endpoints. So we have two simple curves here. This one intersects itself at its endpoints, but not in between. And this one doesn't intersect itself at all. Uh, now, non-simple curves, this curve intersects itself a few times, um, namely in the middle of that flower-looking region there. Uh, that rose looking region. And those are not necessarily its endpoints. Um, let's see. Now, this curve intersects itself once in the middle. So it's also a non simple curve. And then we have a simply connected region, is our next idea. Simply connected region is one in which every closed curve inside this region encloses only points in this region. So the idea is that if we had any closed curve in here, 
the only points that it would contain are points in that region, in that set. And we see in this simply connected set that I've drawn, that is the case. It's, it's technically all shaded in everywhere and it contains every point within it. However, a non-simply connected set, even though it is connected, right? Any two points in the set could be joined by a path. It doesn't meet the criteria that any simple closed curve or any closed curve and it contains points, only points in that region. We see that path and that closed curve in red actually encloses a hole in this set. And, and we see that it doesn't satisfy the definition. So this is a non-simply connected set. So now if we have a vector field F on a simply connected region D, and we suppose that P and Q have continuous first order derivatives and the their first partials, P with respect to Y is equal to Q with respect to X on D, everywhere on D, then we can conclude that F is conser con conservative. So we see that this is the converse result of the previous theorem. We won't prove it here. We can use Green's theorem in our next section, 13.4, to actually prove this as a pretty easy result. So we'll wait until we get there to prove this, uh, this other direction. So those are all the technical results for the fundamental theorem for line integrals. Each one of these proofs is, is covered in the book in a little bit more detail, and I encourage the reader or the viewer to have a look at that and uh, familiarize themselves with these results. Now, if you understand how these results come about, then that's the, most, that's the point of looking at all these proofs. If we understand where they come about, then we, we can remember them better and we can, we can understand what we're actually doing when we use these results. So, uh, hopefully we can get to that point. Remembering the proofs or being able to write the proofs is not necessary, but it will certainly deepen understanding to be able to do so or to at least understand how these proofs work. So in the next video, we'll do more examples though.